Psalm 103, a psalm of David, um, one of my favorites. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all this will be blessed His holy name. And the title tonight, In Praise of Mercy. Um, and, and, you know, it's interesting, we, we, we talk about mercy, but we talk about grace much more than mercy. Because mercy, of course, is always associated with me or you doing something wrong. And, of course, we receive God's mercy because we've all needed God's mercy today. Amen. We've, we've fallen short maybe in some way or another, and, and we need the mercy, but we just love to talk about God's grace. Oh, grace. Grace is like green lights and blue skies. Mercy, ah. But it's interesting there is the correlation between mercy and grace, because mercy is what? Not getting what we deserve. And what do we all deserve? <laughs> yeah, you, you fill in the blank there. Um, but the cool thing is, when we receive mercy, what is it that we are actually receiving? Grace, because grace is getting what we don't deserve. And of course, mercy is compassion towards an offender. And in in God's word, the word mercy is used just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, just all through God's word. And um, think for a moment, and here is really, like in this psalm here, David, he's kind of reflecting, he's, he's, he's writing of his own experiences in regards to God's mercy in his life. And no one knows exactly what he was writing about. We can kind of think about it and, you know, speculate, whatever, but think about it for a minute in your own life as we're going through this, the times that you experienced not even just God's mercy, but mercy in your own life. Think about that for a minute, where you deserved this, and yet, for whatever reason, you got off the hook or someone extended to you, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. Now, of course, in David's life, it could have been the situation with him with Bathsheba and the adultery that was committed, um, the killing of Uriah, in that he really, in reality, should have been what by God? But God had made a covenant. Um, Or maybe it was a time when when David had really rejected Judah. He ran off, you know, and he went to the Philistines. He was there in Gath um, with Achish. And maybe God was upset about that, and he didn't really get what he deserved. Or, or maybe it was when David numbered the children of Israel at the end of his life, and Joab warned him, don't do it, don't do it, David. And David said, no, I want it. And the enemy actually um, encouraged him to do this. And so he numbers the children of Israel. Man, so wrong. And God, of course, dealt with the nation of Israel. When David cried out to God for mercy, he'd rather put his, hands in the, put his life in the hands of a merciful God Instead of just the three things that, that uh, the angel had laid out, and yet still 70,000 of the Israelites were killed. But thinking about in your own life, and I was thinking about this myself, and I started thinking about, man, all the things that God had did in my life. And, and then the stories that were around him, I said, well, I can't share that one. Yee, nope, can't share that one. <laughs> and then this situation happened. Nah, I then I actually went to when I was in third grade. I can share this story. I mean, we're all there. You know what I'm talking about? Some of these things where you've done things that you're just, obviously, that were so wrong, and you should have either gone to jail. A lot of times, these kind of dealt with uh, those kind of situations or whatever. But I remember third grade, 4th of July, back when, you know, kids could buy fireworks and get your hands on anything. I was living in Anaheim. And, um, of course, in my family, my dad, it was, like, absolutely forbidden for us to play with fireworks by ourselves. So me and my buddy, we figured this out. We knew what to do. Well, if we go down the street, around the corner, and then around another corner, we are way far away from our house. No one's going to know, right? So we're out there on the corner. We're just having the time of our life, blowing off fireworks and all this kind of stuff and everything. Well, little did I know the route that my dad used to come home for lunch. So he's, he's, he'd, he would ride his motorcycle to back and forth to work there. And we're out there just lighting these things up, having a great time, thinking this is 4th of July, we're celebrating patriotic, you know, all that kind of stuff and everything. And, uh, and all of a sudden, comes up, and he sees me. And you want to talk about the life uh, just flowing out of your body there. Because <laughs> I was scared to death of my dad, I'm telling you what. And he pulled up, and he did the double take, like, is that really you? And he pulls up, and he says, get home. Well, So I ran home, of course, and he was there, and and he took off um, and didn't deal with me right then and there. 
because he had to get back for, for work. He said, I will take care of you when I get home tonight. And, of course, I would rather just, you know, ran away, put the old hobo sack on my back and taken off, you know, and everything. Um, so I, I just, I schemed and everything. I figured I went and I went to the garage because at that time we used to ride motorcycles all the time. And so I cleaned the garage from corner to corner, spick and span all the motorcycles, just everything, working with my mom, trying to get myself out of this. Mom, you got to get me. And so he comes home from work and we're sitting around the dinner table and I'm just like, I couldn't even eat, man. My stomach was sick. And my dad, you know, he just, he'd catch you. I had forgotten by the time he'd gotten home. But then around the dinner table, we're talking, and everything, all of a sudden, sudden something sparked his memory. He, oh, yeah, we got to do what is it? And my mom kind of stepped in and, and talked about the fact that I had taken care of the garage and this and everything. And, and I just like eyes like saucers and everything, and just kind of like, well, don't be playing with those fireworks again. You understand me? Yes, Dad, yes, Dad, yes, yes. Ah, what's that called? Mercy, mercy, mercy. So think about that in your own heart and your own life. And how that felt, that release, that relief, somebody imparting to you mercy, you, you deserve this, but you got the opposite. Well, here David in this psalm, starting off, and we have here mercy's response. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. David thinking, pondering, remembering at a time when God had extended his mercy toward David. And his soul is overwhelmed with this mercy. He's, he's overwhelmed with what God had did in his life. And for us, as well as you've thought about those situations, and maybe it was God's mercy even after you became a Christian, or just the mercy of somebody in the midst of your own life and your own stupidity. And David here, overwhelmed with it. He just blessed the Lord. We sing this song, and I told Pastor Kevin, make sure we sing this tonight. Three times, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. You get the point? David was so encouraged as he thought about that. And thinking back, even that story reminded me of this man. I was like, I mean, it was like I had redemption. I was saved. I was like, my gosh, because really, I deserved the whipping of the century for playing around with those fireworks because I knew that it was wrong. David here exclaiming, and it reminds me, think about, you know, it's the stories, you know, there's nothing written after the story of the woman who was caught in adultery and Jesus was there. Has her response but can you imagine? And we know the story there in John chapter 8. And the Pharisees bring her before Jesus, and they're basically, you know, testing Jesus. And yet at the end of the story, what does Jesus say to her? Because ultimately, what did she deserve? The law said what? Death, stoning. And, and of course, imagine, she's going. She's dying. She's dead. She's caught. And yet Jesus says what? Hey, where are your accusers? Go and sin no more. Talk about mercy. Talk about, imagine if she could have, we could have been there to hear what she said or she went home to tell the story or whatever. Mercy's response. And they think about Peter, and we talked about Peter a few weeks ago and, um, and how Jesus built him up in, in that story in John chapter 21 where he was restored by Jesus. But of course, Peter denying Christ, not once, not twice, but three times, that's a pretty big deal. And, and yet, in reality, what did Peter deserve? Really, rejection from Christ. Hey, you, you denied the Son of God. You rejected me. You cursed me. And yet, when Peter sees him there on the shore, and they recognize that it's Jesus, there's hope. Maybe. And we, and we know the story. Jesus is there, and he, of course, he restores Peter. Do you love me? Do you love me? Love me. But imagine what Peter must have said and how he must have felt when he walked away from that, because ultimately, Jesus could have been on the shore waiting to do what with Peter? Peter, come here. Come here. We're going to talk. I'm going to deal with you. And, and not extending mercy, uh, but extending really what Peter deserved. And David, bless the Lord. Mercy's response. Then moving on, though, now we have mercy's results in verse 3 and 5. David says here, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And we see this really the result of God's mercy upon David and upon our lives as well. Forgiving your iniquities, do you deserve that? Do you, do you really deserve your sins to be forgiven? No, we don't. 
or the healing. And the healing here, it speaks mainly of the, the soul. Now, God does heal diseases, but he, only does, he doesn't heal all diseases, but he does heal the disease of a sin-sick soul in the forgiveness of the sins. Redeeming your life from destruction, you can even take that to this area of, of mercy and how God redeemed you from that situation you were in. Pulled you up out of that pit, out of the horrible pit you were in. And this idea of redemption, he paid the, the price for my sin, redeeming us from destruction of hell. And I love the fact that he says, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. It's really, in reality, crowning us with salvation in this idea of God's mercy, which ultimately leads and led us to salvation. And satisfying, he says, satisfying my mouth, but really the word mouth there uh, pertains really to my age and my life. Satisfying my life. And as I've gotten older in years, David here, recognizing that God has satisfied his life with the good things of God. And now he, when he brought us into his kingdom, into his a relationship with him, the things that used to satisfy, that brought only emptiness and heartache and pain, now he has satisfied us. Even tonight, we come into a time of worship, satisfying our soul with him, so that our youth is renewed in this idea of, of bringing joy and renewal to our lives every single day. And turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. we got to look at this passage here and this idea of what God has done in our lives and the results of mercy. Because here in this passage, Paul, he uses the phrase that God is what? Rich in mercy. And of course, leading to this idea of, of the result of mercy in our lives yeah, all the things that he's done, and there's things we can, we can look at the, the forgiveness, we can look at the, um, the being redeemed from destruction, the healings, all that kind of stuff, but ultimately it, it, it speaks of our salvation. Ephesians chapter 2, and you he made alive who were what? Dead in sins and trespasses in which you once walked according to this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, don't you just love that? But God, who is rich in mercy. And that's where our salvation started, with his mercy. Because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead, even when we were dead in trespasses, the result really of no mercy he made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you have been saved. You see the correlation there? And raised us up together with him and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. Receiving mercy, which leads us to grace, getting grace, in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So we see the second point there, that... Uh, the result of mercy, the result. And then David going on to say here in verse 6, the Lord executes righteousness and, and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. The third thing we have here is mercy's reality in verse 6 through 10. The reality of the Lord being merciful. And the idea here is that David actually quotes, a verse 8, he quotes from um, Genesis chapter 34, and Paul even refers to that as well, that the Lord executes righteousness and justice, and, 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 and God knowing that back in Exodus chapter 3, that the children of Israel, remember when they came into um, captivity there in Egypt after Joseph had died and Pharaoh, and Pharaoh had passed away, and they didn't know who the children of Israel were. And so what happened? They went into bondage, and God saw, and he heard, and he sent Moses so David here, even, even recognizing a time when God was merciful to the children of Israel because he, he executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. And that's one thing about mercy as well. It isn't so much because you've done something that you deserve wrath, but also God has mercy just because that's who he is. And it's the reality of mercy, a reality of a God that we serve who is a merciful God. He made known his ways to Moses 
and his acts to the children of Israel. And then he quotes here, Exodus 34, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. And in that story there in Exodus that he references, the reality is they deserved wrath. And of course, in that story in Exodus 34, God had taken Moses up to the mountain a second time because just two chapters before that, remember Moses is up on the mountain, Mount Sinai, he's receiving the law, and all was going well up there for Moses 40 days. But what was happening to the children of Israel down in the valley there waiting? Hey, where's Mo? He's gone. Where's our God at? Hey, Aaron, come here, come here. This guy, Moses, he took off. You know, he's, he's probably dead, whatever. They don't know what they were thinking. But he tells, they tell Aaron to do what? Hey, make us a golden calf. Let's do the things that we did in Egypt. How long had it been? And they're already turning against God. So what does Aaron do? Sure, give me all your gold, earrings, nose rings, all those kind of things. Throws it in the fire, and he makes this golden calf. And, of course, God up there in the mountain says, Hey, Moses, you better get down because your people are out of hand. You better get down there and straighten them out because I'm going to come against them. And Moses is like, don't do that, God, and everything. And the whole story goes where Moses intercedes, but in reality, going back, that what did they deserve? I mean, what would we have done if the people had done the same thing to us? And yet God tells Moses, second time up in the mountain, He's going to do the tablets because Moses came down. And what happened with Moses? Got a little upset. What did he do with the tablets? Bam, threw them down. Furious at the people. How could you do this? You're bringing God's wrath upon you. And yet, in reality, they deserved the wrath. And yet, God, again, explained to Moses, no, no, Moses. Yeah, this is what you think, but you know what? I'm really testing you, Moses. I'm testing to see where your heart is with these people that I've given to you, because my heart for them has never changed. I am merciful going back to Exodus chapter 25 when God commands Moses to do what? To make the tabernacle. He gives him all the things. And within the tabernacle is the Holy of Holies. And what does he put inside the Holy of Holies? The Ark of the Covenant. And it's so cool. This is all before it's all even planned. But inside the Ark of the Covenant, God had told Moses, now you're going to take and you're going to put the tablets. You're going to put my law. And ultimately, that law, it was what revealed to us that we were sinners. And God knew before time that we were not going to be able to fulfill the law. So what does he put on top of the Ark of the Covenant? The mercy seat. The mercy seat. Before time, he knew that we would need this mercy. And he told Moses that that's where he would speak to Moses from above. He would hover above the mercy seat but the idea that God would sit there, and I love the symbolism there, that, that above the law, above me and you blowing it, not being able to fulfill the law was what? Mercy, that God knew that we would need. He would reveal this mercy to us, the reality of this mercy. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever, and he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Can you believe that? That's the reality, you guys. Think about it. Even today, even today, if God had dealt with you and me according to our sins. But let's, let's just pile them all together. And yet we see that that wrath was poured out upon who? Christ on the cross for us, for salvation's sake. And even while we continue in Christ and we still sin and we mess up, God is still slow to anger. I mean, imagine if the thought that you just had about whatever and God said, you know what? You sin, boom, you're toast. I mean, I think we would all disappear eventually from the sanctuary. Poof, well, that must have, he must have been thinking about in and out tonight, you know, lusting after the food, you know, craving, whatever. And that person thinking about that, whatever, and we would all... Just think if he did that. And yet, no, God is so cool, slow to anger, abounding in mercy, not dealing with according to his, 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 our sins. And, and Hosea says that God desires mercy above what? Above sacrifice. So reality, you guys, we deserve no mercy, but God's mercy is the reality in our lives. And you know what? That same mercy needs to come from us as well, you guys. 
the reality of God's mercy. And then moving on, verse 11 through 14, we have mercy's reach. How far does it go? As for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As the father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are destined. It's so cool that David here. Now think about it when David went out and looked into the heavens. For as the heavens are high above the earth. Now, that was pretty high. And yet now, how high are the heavens above the earth? We have no idea. Infinity and beyond, as uh, Buzz would say. But so great is his mercy. Look at the comparison. Look at the, he's trying to describe to us mercy's reach. It's, it's out of reach. It's just it's completely gone. Just going on and on and on towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west. And it's so cool you think about that. Now, if you started right here and you started walking east, you would never hit west. If you started right here and you started walking west, you would never hit east. And that, of course, going out into the universe forever and ever and ever, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Now, you think about the fact that we still deal and we struggle with these sins that we commit. And maybe it's some pretty big stuff. And yet, look at what God is saying. The reality of his mercy towards me and you is this. His mercy is greater. It's out of this world. What he has done with our sins. And Micah says he has cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. Back then, they had no idea how deep the sea was. Deep, deep, deep. Sea's pretty deep. And yet, when we think about how far he's removed them from us, it's endless. So we have to live in that place, recognizing, yes, we make mistakes. But guess what? God knew it. And people make mistakes in their lives, and we're to extend that, that, that same type of mercy and forgiveness to them as well. But it's reach, and it, 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 you can see the, the vertical and the horizontal, what does that look like? All coming together at the cross. It's so cool. So we have the height, we have the width, but also we have the depth. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. Because he knows what? He knows a frame. He remembers that we are dust. Remember that God remembers that when you're so hard on yourself. Or remember that when somebody does something against you or me and you have the ability to forgive or extend mercy or not, what should we do? See, nobody in the universe is out of reach of God's mercy. It is infinite. And we see that mercy's reach is beyond our, really, our ability to even comprehend. And yet, that's the idea we're talking about here. And then lastly, in verse 15 through 18, we have mercy's reign. How long will mercy go on for? He says, for as for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. The wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. And it's interesting, when you go to, you know, the cemetery, Green Hills, whatever, and you, and you walk around, and, and we, I do this. I, I like to try and find, like, the oldest headstone. A little morbid, maybe. I don't know, but you see, and the sad thing about it is that at one time, I'm there for somebody in that cemetery, right? But the people that we find these gravestones, these headstones that are maybe, they were born in the 1800s, late 1800s, and, and they've been gone a long time. Well, the people who would come and visit them, guess what? They've been gone a long time as well. Nobody, but nobody, but nobody even knows that that headstone is there anymore. Kind of weird, huh? We are going to be forgotten. Chuck Smith will eventually someday be forgotten. But, but, moving on, verse 17, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Now, how long is that? How long is that? Turn to Psalm 136 real quick. That's just easy for you to find. I didn't have you going through the Bible too much tonight. I didn't make you work too hard. But tonight, Psalm 136, so cool. 26 times the psalmist uses the phrase, for his mercy endures forever. We're just going to read a few of these verses here. And this even is 
mercy's response. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. To him alone who does great wonders, for his mercy endures forever. You get the point? To him who by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. And of course, this was written to have a time of response back and forth. To him who laid out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. To him who made the great lights, for his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endures forever. And the moon and stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever. And we see that God's mercy will reign forever. Heaven and earth are going to pass away. We are going to pass away. What we see, what we know will all pass away. But God's mercy will endure forever, everlasting to everlasting. And turn one last time to Lamentations chapter 3 before we go into a time of prayer. And this is where we need to live. This is where we need to plant ourselves in this idea of mercy and recognizing that, that in all that goes on in our lives, ultimately, God wants us to be merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall what? Obtain mercy. So that's the challenge for us because we all love mercy, right? But you remember the story of the um, unmerciful servant or the unrighteous servant who went to the master who, who, was, who was calling his debt. Come in here. You owe me millions. And he cried out, oh, please, please, please forgive me. Please forgive me. And what does the master do? All right. Had compassion on him. Forgave him the debt entirely. And what does that unfaithful servant do? The unrighteous servant goes out and grabs someone who owed him 10 bucks by the throat. Threw him into debtor's prison. And of course, the master found out about it. God found out about it and did what to him? Threw him back in jail. But Lamentations chapter 3, 21, reflecting upon this idea of mercy. This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope that through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Anybody need mercy tonight? Anybody fearful of being consumed by the things that we have done? Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions, they fell not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. In verse 31, dropping down, for the Lord will not cast off forever, though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. And so tonight, um, just uh, um, a trip through this psalm. To, to bring us really ultimately um, to a, a, a greater place of love for the Lord. And, and, and he said, though, David, there's this little interesting point he puts in there. Three times he says, this mercy is extended to those who fear him. Now, Paul told the Roman believers, quoting Exodus, I think it is 32, that God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy and compassion on whom he will have compassion. Um, I, I can't dictate to God by how I act his mercy. Because remember, God demonstrated his own love for us that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. We didn't deserve that. And we don't deserve his mercy, but God can have mercy on anybody. But David throws in there three times that this mercy is extended towards those who fear him. I think in David writing this, it's in response to God ultimately having mercy on David because in all the instances where David really blew it, David what? He repented. He was sorry for what he did. Now think about us and our kids, for example. And we'll close right around here. I'm, I'm open to close here. That if, if your son or daughter did something and they came to you and, and they knew, like I was, I knew I was dead trouble. I knew I was just like, you know what? You might as well just kill me right now. And my dad could see that. He knew that. My eyes big like that and he's looking at me and, ah, okay, Mercy. But what if I had done all those things with the fireworks and he caught me and I walked home and, and he comes home and I said, I don't care what you say, I could care less. I'll play around with fireworks. Anytime I want to play with fireworks, kind of a deal. Do you think I would have received mercy? Man, I would have been dead. <laughs> and, and yet, that's, I think that's the idea here with David because when he was convicted of his sin, when he recognized, I've messed up. And, and that's the cool thing about it, that when God speaks to your heart and you recognize those things, there is that, that mercy. God wants to be merciful. 
He tells us in Micah that he loves, he wants us to love mercy. And, and of course, that's what he desires, mercy above all things. But of course, we don't want to throw that, that grace in God's face either. And so it's something to ponder and think about uh, even tonight as we go to the communion table. Now, it's interesting as we talked about mercy, correlation with grace, that Hebrews 4.18 says, let us now therefore come boldly to what? The throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And of course, we've all been extended mercy and we, we have not got what we deserved. You're all still here tonight. Praise God. No one's disappeared. And yet, when we receive mercy, ultimately we are getting what we don't deserve, which is what grace is. And of course, the wrath of God poured out upon Christ for our sake, taking the penalty for our sin because ultimately we deserve the cross. Amen? Ultimately, we deserve to hang there. And yet God, because he was merciful, he provided the means by which we could have this mercy in sending his son. So as the worship team comes back up, and we go into this time now of reflecting upon our own lives, and maybe in a place where you, you go, you've gone back in time and in mind and heart, and, and in my mind, you know, share a little story about the fireworks, no, the other things that were there, where I did not get what I deserved. Standing here tonight before you, I have gotten what I don't deserve. Because we all deserve what? To be cut off. And so as I pray, and as you make your ways with this time of worship, let's go to the communion table, and let's just thank the Lord for his mercy that we have received tonight, that, that pours out upon us in grace, in God's favor, in God's love, and God's blessings in our lives. And then tonight, going out of here, of course, you may have need of extending mercy to somebody. And then during communion, I'll have the prayer team come forward, the pastors come forward, and maybe there's something you need to come down and get right with God because you have not been merciful, or maybe you need to come down and again receive because you have not forgiven yourself of something. You're still living in that place where the enemy's got you condemned and you haven't received God's mercy. Remember, he's mindful that we're dust. He knew that you were going to blow it. He provided this mercy way back, way back in preparation, the mercy seat where God sits and looks upon us. And as a father pities his son, so the Lord pities those who fear him. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you, Lord, so much for your mercy that will extend and last for all eternity. And Lord, when we get to heaven and look upon your face and Lord, recognizing that you took upon yourself that which we deserve, Lord, and you poured out mercy, which blossomed into grace, Lord. I pray as we go to this communion table again tonight, just reflecting, just remembering those times, God, where you came through for us and, and even looking at, Lord, maybe the reality that you spared our lives in a time when we did not deserve even that because you knew that we would be here tonight receiving salvation, grace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless our time at the table tonight, we pray, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.